um, will be shared and published to our YouTube page. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and read Dr. Cerner bio. So Dr. Mary Cernobori is the coordinator of trauma-informed schools for Metro National Public Schools. She holds a PhD in special education from Vanderbilt University and a board-certified behavior analyst. She is dedicated to social justice and equipping educators uh, those and those who care for children with the information and strategies they need to promote compassionate school environments that support healthy development and school success for all. From a collective impact lens, she developed and drives implementation of a system-wide approach to raising awareness about the impacts of childhood adversity on school success and lifelong health and wellness, and guides and supports uh, implementation of whole school and individualized trauma-informed school practices that are healing-centered and focused on resilience and empowerment. Dr. Cernobori has extensive experience teaching in the classroom, speaking, school-based consultation, behavior analysis, and research, including a TEDx talk about trauma-informed schools and as a co-author of the book, Managing Challenging Behaviors in Schools, Research-Based Strategies That Work, and multiple journal articles and book chapters. Most importantly, she gets her greatest joy from her role as a parent of two sons who attend public schools. So Dr. Cernobori, we are so grateful to have you, um, and, I, and I know that we all can't wait to learn. And, and see this presentation. So go go right ahead. Great, thank you so much, Jen. Uh, it's a real honor to be here with you all, and mostly it's a real honor to be able to highlight and share the hard work of so many educators, school staff, uh, you know, even parents and those that work with children. Uh, the hard work that they're doing day in and day out. So. Um, I'm going to talk about our journey uh, towards systemic change and promoting this paradigm shift in Metro Nashville Public Schools uh, to uh, promote widespread awareness about what all kids need for healthy development and the impacts of trauma and toxic stress and uh, really transforming many of our schools through trauma-informed practices. Um, so I'll dive right in. Uh, I do guess, I guess I want to mention before I start that we have such strong partnerships. I'm going to feature that uh, some throughout our hour together, but we've had uh, so much support from Building Strong Brains and TCCY, uh, certainly ACE Nashville, the Tennessee Department of Education, the Office of Criminal Justice Programs, and a VOCA Victims of Crime Act grant, as well as the Healing Trust. So we, we just wouldn't be able to do this work without such strong community partnerships. Um, so I'm going to jump in by just uh, kind of trying to convey the huge magnitude of my organization. So Metro Nashville Public Schools is mammoth. Uh, I did some consulting in Delaware, not or speaking actually in Delaware, not so long ago. And our school district is almost as big as their state, the Department of Ed in their state. So we are the second largest urban school district in Tennessee. We're about the 44th largest in the country. So we have about 11,000 employees. Um, as it says on the slide, we have 86,000 students um, of our 11,000 employees. Employees about a little about half are teachers, so we have 169 different schools and many more that we you know contract with or work with as well. Um, so each of those 169 plus schools are you know in a, a large organization in themselves. So when you look at a district, um, you know I, I use the words systemic change or education system change, organizational change. The magnitude of the organization, uh, like those words don't quite capture it if you're not also aware of the magnitude of the organization. So we have about 86,000 kids, 76% or so are classified as economically disadvantaged, and we're doing a lot of great work within a three-tiered model of prevention and intervention. So um, universal practices, more targeted supports for kids who need more, and then highly intensive individualized supports across all the areas of, of what we do, which is academics, social emotional learning, and supporting behavior. Um, so, 
when you think about just the education lens, you know, a school's job is to teach academics and to help kids be successful in school and life, you know, in academically and in their future vocations. But trauma and toxic stress is not just a mental health problem that we can leave for the mental health professionals to fix. Instead, it's an educational problem that if left unaddressed, really can derail the you know academic and school success of countless kids. So we're we've become well versed, and we're continuing to become well versed in in the whole child. The fact that social emotional health is an essential prerequisite for academic success, and we can't just pour a bunch of you know math and academic fa uh, uh, facts into kids' brains if they're not healthy and well. So whole child wellness is paramount. And we know that trauma and toxic stress uh, plays a role in this. So we know that adverse childhood experiences in schools are highly prevalent. In fact, um, uh, it's estimated that at the elementary level, at least half of kids will have at least one ACE. About a quarter will have three or more, and more than six or seven percent are likely to have many. And by the time kids get to high school, uh, overall prevalence, we can estimate that at least 13 out of 30 kids in a typical mainstream high school classroom will have three or more ACEs. So we know this stuff is prevalent. We also know that ACEs can and do occur universally across students from all, all walks of life, but the access to healing isn't. We're also becoming well, well aware that um, this is often an invisible ec epidemic. Sometimes we know the things that are happening in our kids' lives. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're not even privy to that information. And then also the way it presents in schools uh, can be counterintuitive. Be <laughs> behavior can, can really come out or social, emotional, or, or just unmet needs can come out sideways. And it doesn't often look the way you expect. So the symptoms is, uh, can be counterintuitive. But most importantly, um, we're really growing awareness that adults at school are often the first line of defense. So we actually spend more time with kids than parents do. Uh, kids spend about 15,000 hours in the classroom between uh, kindergarten and 12th grade. So we spend so much time with them. And arguably, you could say, oh, well, you don't spend more time with them than parents do. It's a, it can be close to equal if you look at the actual hours. But with parents at home, kids are sleeping for eight, nine, hope, you know, maybe 10 hours a night. With us, you know, they're active and engaged. So we're really trying to leverage that power of, you know, and, and optimize the time that we have with kids because um, we pl have a, a tremendous role in either furthering distress, perpetuating distress for kids and families who already have pretty distressing lives. We can even re-traumatize in the school setting if we're uninformed. Um, or the whole point of this work is we have tremendous power and opportunity to really buffer the impacts of toxic stress and trauma and empower kids, promote resilience and post-traumatic growth. So that's really what this work is all about. Um, but there is a recognition that I'll just read the quote, the neural pathways in the brain that deal with stress are the same ones that are used for learning. So we, if we as a country or as a school district want our kids to achieve more academically, we can't do this if they're not emotionally healthy. So again, this uh, increased focus on caring for the whole child, not just the academic piece that schools may have traditionally, you know, uh, prioritized above all else. Um, so stress, toxic stress, trauma can impact academics. In fact, um, one particular study showed that in comparison to kids with no known ACEs, kids with three or more were three times more likely to experience academic failure, five times more likely to experience severe attendance problems, six times more likely to experience severe school behavior concerns, and four times more likely to have health complaints, like my belly hurts or my head hurts. And they do have those, those health ailments because of stress. So we're increasing our recognition of this. Um, I guess I'll mention my own background because it's kind of important. So I've dedicated you know, my whole career, about 20 years in so far, 
to working with and, and supporting kids with or at risk for emotional and behavior disorders. So about 20 years ago, I started teaching at a self-contained school for kids with emotional disturbance. So they highly intensive behavior needs. And at that time, um, I had a psychology undergrad, but I uh, didn't think I wanted to teach. So I started substitute teaching, knowing very little about how to teach. Um, very quickly, I was offered a job and got my master's in full certification within uh, two years and, and taught in that school immediately. But on day one, I was a really green teacher, didn't really know what I was doing. Yet on day one, it was abundantly clear to me that every single child in my middle school classrooms uh, had far too much chaos, dysfunction, we didn't use the word trauma at that time in the education sector, but traumatic experiences, toxic stress uh, that was clearly impacting their, their school experience and performance. And the other thing that was abundantly clear to me, even though I didn't know much at that time, was that what was happening in that school setting, which by the way was another state, um, not only wasn't helping them, academically, behaviorally, socially, emotionally. But in fact, I think many of the practices that were happening in that building were actually re-traumatizing and causing further harm. So I taught in a variety of settings, um, including uh, mainstream, you know, elementary classrooms, mainstream high school classrooms, and saw the exact same patterns uh, happening, perhaps at a less intense level. And so I wanted to be able to do more. So I came here uh, to study uh, positive behavior interventions and supports and behavior analysis, got a PhD in special education, studying with, you know, the top leaders in the field on this stuff. And then I came to work here in MMPS as a behavior analyst. So now in MMPS, I'm serving uh, a dozen schools, you know, not just my own classroom. And again, the exact same pattern. Every single kid that was referred to me as a behavior analyst, and by the way, all of these students were general education students, so they did not have diagnosed disabilities of any form. Um, same pattern, every single one of them had far more than their fair share of adversity and lack of access to safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments. And it was so clear to me that that was what was impacting their ability to be successful at school. And then, um, gosh, this was probably 2016 or before, maybe late 2015, uh, I attended two presentations in a month, a period of about two months. And the first was from Jen Croft, who talked about ACEs and who talked about the impact. And then I was able to attend a presentation by uh, Dr. Vince Felitti, one of the primary investigators of the original ACE study. And I was just blown away. Like this is the answer. This is the root. I'm ready to dedicate the rest of my career to doing this work. And it just transformed, you know, my trajectory and I, you know, became on a mission. All right, we got to transform practices in this huge district. So at the same time, um, I'm engaging in ACE Nashville and they really gave me the support and the courage because this is barrier breaking stuff. And when you're, you're the one that's promoting system change disruptor, right? You're the disruptor. Sometimes you get pushback, but with sort of the encouragement and mentoring in many ways of ACE Nashville, of building strong brains initiative, I just put a stake in the sand and said, I'm going to do this. And then because we got funding and, you know, very gradually now, four years later, I am just blown away at the difference that this has made in the district. Not today, in, four years ago, I was kind of viewed as, oh yeah, maybe this is this passing thing, or you're not being the best behavior analyst because you can't measure, you know, what's happening inside brains and bodies or pushback. Four years later, now everyone is realizing this is truthful, this is real, this is based on science, this is what's happening in the kids that we love and care about. And so the, the movement that I've been able to be a part of here, um, again, with huge 
gratitude to the collective impact in our state and otherwise and locally and good people that have supported the process. Um, I'm just blown away. So now we can really frame our work looking at two things that can go wrong in childhood, right? So one is when things happen that shouldn't happen. This is British psychiatrist D.W. Winnicott who said it, and I just love this framing. So when things happen that shouldn't happen, like ACEs, right? But the second one, when things don't happen that should happen. So safe, stable, nurturing relationships or environments. Um, we recognize for healthy development to occur, kids need the presence of non-stress, present, emotionally attuned, emotionally available adults, whether it's at home or teachers at school. And so we really try to hone in on those things, but our focus is really on the second one. So we don't, we do not have a deficit mindset. We don't look at the ACE score instead, because it's not about the event itself. It's so much more about the presence or absence of the protective factors like safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments in a child's life, because ACEs do not have to equal trauma. If we can pile on supports for kids, we can really buffer the impacts of some of the real legitimate big things they face out of school outside of school. So that's our mission. And our work is all about fostering resilience and empowerment. Um, that's where our work must begin, you know, focus on throughout and end, because we know that humans have an astounding capacity to use challenging life experiences to create richer and more meaningful ways of living. So in the short term, the adversity can be really hard. In the long term, it can really, if, if positive meaning is made from the event, it can just transform, you know, create stronger kids that are dedicated to, you know, making this world a better place. So I really feel that we can change this world in one generation through our kids. That's why I'm in education and, you know, trauma-informed practices, healing-centered, um, empowering practices have the power to do that. So you might be wondering, if you're not from the education sector, what is a trauma-informed school anyways? So I love how the Attachment and Trauma work, uh, Network talks about this as kind of a broad brushstroke frame. Um, of course, it's fundamental that there has to be shared awareness between all staff, like understanding the brain science, right, and, and the, you know, the foundational information. But really, trauma-informed schools focus on safety. So the whole school culture is a safe place, not just physically safe from, you know, say an active intruder or, you know, the tornado or something like that, but emotionally safe places, behaviorally safe places. When behavioral mistakes occur, is that safe? Is it going to be a way to, you know, support, hold kids accountable, but also teach them, you know, better ways of behaving? Um, academically safe. That's huge when academic mistakes are made. Trauma-informed schools also focus on connection. That's huge. That's probably the fun fundamental piece of this work, relationship-rich environments, and we talk ad nauseum about that. The third one that's often missed in many um, existing educational practices, but we're really bringing in like a firestorm now because, because of the trauma-informed schools movement is regulation. So a trauma-informed school focuses on regulation. A lot of the work that I've tried to um, promote throughout the district is in the area of regulation, which falls beautifully in the social-emotional learning core competencies. Um, but we've got to have an understanding of that brain science and an understanding of um, not just self-managing behavior, but physiological regulation. And, and that one has the power to transform. And then of course, trauma-informed schools focus on learning and make learning environments a fun place where learning is enjoyable. Because after all, that actually is what's best for the brain and, and kids learn better when they're enjoying what they're doing. Um, so briefly, I just wanna share the seven practices that we're promoting um, throughout our school. So these practices are intended to be implemented school-wide at the universal tier one level, um, and they really help to shift school culture and climate to be a more positive, happier, nurturing, supportive, healing-centered place. 
Um, and then all the, the actual classroom practices are meant to be implemented school-wide well, as well. So every single gets it. So the first is what I just mentioned in the last slide, um, that shared awareness that comes through training and development for whole school faculties and really everyone who interacts with kids. The second one is this mindset shift um, that comes through training, that comes through practice, that comes through understanding and working on ourselves. Uh, that mindset shift that prioritizes safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments, not only is, what, is what's best for um, the whole child, but as the critical foundation for learning. If, even if we've got that teacher that's only interested in is math scores, this matters too because that's how the brain works. The third one is looking at our um, physical environment. How can we transform our physical environment to be more uh, uh, calming, less stressful, the so low stress physical environment? The fourth one is integrating stress reduction or regulation practices into the daily school schedule. So regularly practicing these skills so that kids have them in their repertoire available to use them when they need them, when things get stressful and hard. Um, the fifth one is regulation spaces in every classroom. You may have heard of Peace Corners before. And by the way, number four and five, we're going to really hone in on uh, before our time up, is up together. Uh, the sixth one is the ability to respond to symptoms of stress and dysregulation versus react to problem behavior. So when challenging behaviors occur, how can we um, be a behaviorally safe place by responding versus reacting? Uh, I'll say just briefly, I had the real honor of presenting about trauma-informed de-escalation to about 200, all, every um, executive principal in the district and all the high-level executive leadership, so about 250 high-level leaders. And I focus heavily on regulation and this responding versus reacting, so trauma-informed de-escalation. And that, with everybody understanding how behavior can come out sideways and how when it happens, we have to first make sure kids are regulated and support them in doing that, doing so, and connect with them empathetically and support, make sure that we're getting their needs met. And then we can reason through what happened and implement some sort of a restorative uh, accountability action if that's needed. But I'm so excited to have shared that with that entire group because as with all the work that I do in MMPS, my team and I do in MMPS, um, same as yesterday with the principals, we're just the spark. I'm just informing and equipping folks I'm just the spark to allow this movement to ignite. And I think there was a real spark lit there yesterday with all, all the executive leadership in the district. So I'm so excited about that, that piece and responding to symptoms of stress and dysregulation versus reacting to problem behavior. And then finally, number seven, it's number seven, but it shouldn't be. It should be number one. This really is what this work is all about. Our workforce has to be well. We have to be able to support our educators if we're going to expect them to support kids. So systematic strategies and support for promoting educator wellness in the form of self-care, of course, but also collective care. Um, there, I, I believe that self-care is an ethical ob obligation for everyone who works with kids. That's very much true. I believe that collective care is also an ethical obligation, meaning our organizations have an obligation to promote the wellness of their uh, faculty. Um, I'm proud to say that MMPS actually just won our coordinated school health district-wide, just won a big award for the way we promote um, staff wellness. Um, so many principals do amazing jobs at supporting that for their faculty, but we have a lot, a lot of work to do there still. So that's kind of the overview of the practices we're recommending. Um, and I'm going to get into the project a little bit more. But first, I, I wish I had a photo of us up here, but <laughs> I don't have it. Um, so I coordinate the work in the district. I've been in this position since, I think, 2016. Uh, maybe that's about right. And I was kind of trying to coordinate this work solo. 
up in – well, except for the exception of one trauma-informed um, specialist at our pilot school, our highly intensive pilot school, who also started in 2016, which is Paul Hamilton. I'll mention them again later, but you very well may have heard uh, Matthew Portell give amazing talks previously in this uh, forum as well as many, many others. Um, so basically it was me for the district, and she was at that one individual school. Um, then last January, so eight months ago, right, um, I was able to grow my team with two more. So I brought two district-level specialists on board. Uh, serving the north half of the, half of the district and the south half of the district, and I just shared the size of our district. So each one was responsible for supporting, you know, teachers who support 44,000 kids. <laughs> so that's a lot. Um, fortunately, again, with so much help from outside advocacy and some funding, as well as district investment with the local budget, now my team has grown to six specialists. So each of these fine, fine folks serves two clusters of schools, which is about 25 schools each. Um, so pretty excited about that. So what do we do? Here are our main goals. Um, basically, I'm not phrasing the first one as a goal, but our vision is, or mission and vision is to leverage the power of collective impact. And I'll talk about that in a second. But our three goals are Number one, promoting widespread awareness through readily accessible training for all MMPS schools in the district. The second one is supporting trauma-informed school culture and practices throughout, a district, throughout the district as a result of that training. And then um, even more so, including resources in our pilot and focus schools. And then the third one is district-wide implementation of Handle With Care. So for the rest of our time together, I'm gonna talk through those goals that I just stated uh, briefly. And then I really wanna capture the voices. This is, this is not about me at all. I don't even like that it's my voice on this call. I really am aiming to capture the voices of the educators in many, many schools, many different departments in MMPS for the ways that they're implementing this work out throughout the district. So I'm going to share a body of um, testimonials that I've gathered from principals and other school staff um, to, to share with you to try to bring their voice into this conversation. So first I'll talk about, go, go into detail about each of these three goals. So the first one, leveraging the power of collective impact. Again, with a district of this magnitude, we're talking about systems change. So I was very much inspired by the way Building Strong Brains went about their work, collective impact effort, and working with ACE Nashville, getting to know collective Im impact. So when I conceptualized this work, you know, four years ago, or however <laughs> the time blends together, um, it, was, it was almost like a no-brainer to me. Oh, well, we need a collective impact model within MMVS because in a school district like this, we don't just have teachers, we have school counselors, we have principals, we have special education, uh, we have English language, English learner department, social workers, we've got school resource officers and school security um, behavior teams. So my goal has been to get this information in front of all the different area experts, right, professionals in the field that have their own expertise, just simply equip them with the information to inform their day-to-day -day work so they can go about what they're experts at in a more trauma-informed way. So we intentionally collaborate with as many departments as possible. So I've listed a few here, and then that goes for the com community organizations too. I think in my opening I talked, you know, adequately about, you know, how hugely important it was to be nestled in local and state efforts that are doing this work, we wouldn't have been able to do this without that. Um, and then in addition, we collaborate and, and try to do the same, you know, informing pre-service educators. We, we work with every, almost every university in town. Um, we guest lecture in pre-service teacher or pre-service counselor um, classes really quarterly, we collaborate with the Metro Nashville Police Department and many, so many others that aren't even listed here. So um, 
the second goal is promoting this widespread awareness through readily available training. So again, kind of um, trying to replicate some things that Building Strong Brains and TCCY was doing um, to meet the training needs of a district of this size, particularly on our professional development days when, you know, I, I could have 18 schools who want training that day. So clearly just myself and six trainers, we can't be in 18 different places at once. So it was obvious to me that we needed an in-house train the trainer model for that reason, but also because in, um, this information or the way we apply trauma-informed care in an educational setting is obviously unique. It's very, very different than a clinical setting. So, um, or, you know, a nonprofit sector or different than other sectors. So the principles are, are pretty much the same, but in our setting, we're talking about classrooms large group social settings where there's 25 kids at a time with one adult typically, you know, to meet the needs of all those kids. And by the way, the main priority is teaching academics. So there's a lot of unique considerations when it comes to trauma-informed school practices. So we just really wanted to refine our material so it would speak to educators and make sure there were educators speaking to educators that had street cred so, so the participants would, would buy in um, and then again hone in on those practices that will actually be effective in a school setting. So that's been really exciting and the, uh, we were partnered with Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth, of course, um, the earlier training for trainers, the first couple, Jen and her team ca came and they did the first half and I did the second half on the school practices. Um, since then, they've given the blessing, so I host the full training myself, but um, man, you see the numbers on the screen. I'm not sure what else to say except for that I'm blown away by the fact that over the course of the last three to four years, um, we've trained over 15,000 folks. We've trained over 10,500 faculty and staff. Our focus is on school-wide faculty as much as possible. So we've given over 200 of those presentations and then whole departments as well. Because when you get, like, like all the principals yesterday, when you get all the same disciplined colleagues together, that's when you shift culture and culture shifts practices. So that it's kind of like the, the lowest hanging fruit of the biggest bang for our buck. And, and we've, I, we're, we're really moving towards accomplishing that. And then we've trained, you know, close to 5,000 MMPS stakeholders. We're really trying to increase our focus on student presentations as well. And this year we're starting to do a whole lot more of that already. In fact, I had my team at a, a high school yesterday and then they were at another high school a couple of weeks ago. So that's exciting. So the training's just really quick. I'll share this slide. Um, our Part one, our foundational training is similar to the Building Strong Brains training, um, but tailored, very much tailored for educators. Uh, so the role of life experiences in shaping brain development and school success. And then the second one is all about trauma-informed school culture and practices. And then we offer a host of uh, uh, supplemental or additional trainings as well. The part two are mitigating ACEs through trauma-informed school practices. That one can be a year-long series where I go in and, tr and develop the staff every month for a whole year because there's so much content in there. So the, the additional trainings kind of um, can fall under that umbrella. Um, and then we strongly recommend implicit bias and culturally responsive teaching and other equity trainings offered uh, in the district because that this work cannot be separated from that. That is also fundamental. Oh, and then the second thing that we, uh, oh, the second goal is supporting implementation of trauma-informed practices throughout the district as a result of training, um, really those six or seven practices I talked about a few slides back. And now with a team of six, we're able to offer on-site consultation and technical support to all of these schools uh, who request it throughout the district. Um, so individualized teacher consults, we can assist with meetings, whether it's teacher teams or student support team or IEP meetings or parent meetings. Um, we certainly make intervention recommendations and model um, implementation of those trauma-informed um, interventions. We might 
model implementation of Peace Corners or teach a class how to use a Peace Corner. We can observe students, assist with safety plans. Um, we can go in and assist with trauma-informed de-escalation when kids are, um, you know, in an intensive behavioral challenge um, and help meet, you know, help support and meet their emotional needs and understand why this behavior might be coming out sideways in a way that can get to the root of it and find healing rather than just the traditional behavioral, you know, reinforcement or uh, punishment even. Um, so trauma-informed de-escalation really shifts that. So we can assist schools with that. Um, teacher support around wellness and self-care, that's another big area of emphasis. We really recognize that if we're going in to consult with a teacher, we're there to help them be able to support their students, but they can't support their students if they don't feel cared for themselves. And oftentimes we, be, we can be just a support for that teacher's wellness and self-care as a place for healthy debriefing, you know, healthy, um, you know, talking about their own stress and their own needs. Um, and then finally, school-wide consults, because again, this work is best implemented at the school-wide level. Um, I said I'd mention Paul Hamilton again, so I'm gonna now hone in on our pilot and focus schools. So Paul Hamilton, of course, in, in year one of our Building Strong Brains grant, starting in uh, 2016, highly intensive pilot school. So they've done incredible work um, at all three tiers of prevention and intervention and really um, embedding trauma-informed practices into everything that they do. Um, and so I, and you've probably heard some of the excellent work that Matthew Portal has shared before. Um, but in addition, we have more than 18 trauma-informed focus schools who are doing very, very similar things. I just can't sing these schools' praises enough. So we've got, the reason it's more than 18 is, is because I, the, I can't keep up with the demand. So it's, it's like regularly more schools are like, all right, we're doing this. And my numbers are growing of, of how many schools are committed to doing something on a school-wide level. So each of these schools has agreed to some level of ongoing ACES training, but more so that paradigm shift, that adult mindset shift, but also implementation of at least one, but more often two trauma-informed school practices at the school-wide level. So the first of which is that regulation spaces in every single classroom. On this slide, it's called Peace Corners. Some schools call them Peace Corners. Some schools call them Cozy Corners or uh, care places, uh, not care places, but uh, a variety of things. They might call them Australia. Um, they can, but what they are is regulation spaces in every classroom and this systematic approach. And then the second one is integrating those um, self-regulation, stress reduction activities into the daily schedule. So I'm gonna share with you a couple videos that really showcase these two strategies. So rather than hearing me say it, you can see it in action. But before I, yeah, the next, the next slide is gonna be a video. So before I share that, I just wanna say that this fall, like fall 2019, um, one thing that I'm so, I have such the honor of doing, I'm like the regulation or fidget tool lady. I think everybody in the district knows I'm always passing out regulation tools. So we've passed out over 600 Peace Corner starter kits um, to teachers and school staff this fall. Uh, you, the picture, the lower picture shows what those Peace Corner starter kits include. And this year we didn't have the book, but we had all those other things. So about that, like that is what would be in a Peace Corner starter kit. What that means is that we resource over 550 classrooms to have a Peace Corner in this district. It's like you can't even capture the, um, the, the help, the support that so countless kids get as a result of that. So I'm just so proud of it. <laughs> so excited about the hard work that teachers are doing to implement these things. So without further ado, I'm going to show uh, the first video that um, highlights these twice daily stress reduction practices at Napier Elementary. So many schools are doing it with a program, implementing it with a program called Move This World that I was able to support them with in past years using grant funding. Um, this year, 
these schools use their local school budget because it's making a difference in their building. So they, they pay for it themselves. And then many other schools are doing something similar with a program that does, without a program that costs money. So they had just learned the mindfulness-based calming brain breaks to implement themselves. So I love this program called Move This World. It does not have to be done with a, a four-cost program. It can be done with very, very little or no money at all if teachers feel, you know, equipped to implement calming brain breaks. So have a look at this video, and I hope you can hear it. Move This World was presented to us from uh, a district person. And I can be honest with you, I was hesitant at first. But once I saw the videos and I saw the impact that it was having on the kids, I was like, okay, this is it. There was one little boy. He used to tear the school up. He used to come to school angry, mad, hating everything. We just couldn't quite figure it out. With Move This World, it gave him the words. And it gave him a way to identify his emotions. It provided the common language provided the practices. It provided something that he could relate to. And so we've definitely seen a true impact from this world. So I have one student, every time he gets upset, instead of talking back and being disrespectful, I see him actually like tightening and releasing, and I know what he's doing, and I see him breathe to calm himself down. So I have a student, and at the beginning of the year when he first entered my classroom, he got really worked up, like very easily, and he would just scream and kick. And now I see him walk off to the side if he gets like upset about something and he'll just do his deep breathing. And he'll come up to me and he'll be like, Mr. Greenberg, it's my deep breathing. Did you see? They really do use it. And that's just one story, but this happens every day. It's built this huge classroom culture. It really made my students be able to connect with one another. Just to hear them be able to talk with one another back and forth and find ways to be able to calm down or de-stress. It's, it's just incredible to watch impacted the way that they feel about school. It's impacted their routine. It also gives them a way to express their emotions when they do get upset. You can just tell the difference in the way that our students are responding to their emotions, their conflicts, the way they're understanding each other and themselves. I love the fact that it moves so feels that the culture for the school and the classroom and everybody on one accord and we're all doing the same thing. It's just, it makes a big difference a tremendous decrease in the number of behaviors. And I don't have any position in those classrooms. It gives me different strategies to go through as well, and it helps me understand them better. It's really easy to use. It's user-friendly. The kids love it. You know, the Napier way is something that we need. All children can learn. All children can succeed. And they just need support academically, socially, emotionally, all of that. At the center of it is about relationships with our students, our families, and one another. Napier is a place that should prove that success can happen here. It can happen anywhere. And so hopefully when people experience Napier, they experience something extraordinary. So I hope you could hear that video well. Um, so that was Dr. Lawless at Napier, and she is just an extraordinary human being. I'm so proud of <laughs> the work that she's doing over there, you know, and I had almost nothing to do with it. She is just implementing the most innovative, incredibly incredible things with restorative practices and social emotional learning and leveraging community resources. Um, it's it's really impressive what what she's doing over there, um, and her her kids her population have a whole lot of needs, and and many of them have have come from some difficult challenging life experiences. But gosh, they're brilliant! Oh my gosh, those kids are brilliant. So. The second practice that our focus schools uh, are implementing school-wide, and, and this one, of course, has taken off like wildfire throughout the district as well. We got Peace Corners, and I couldn't even count the classrooms throughout. You know, so many teachers that aren't even in a focus school, just individual teachers who are implementing these things in their classroom. So the second video is a feature from Paul Hamilton, uh, but I just want to capture what that strategy looks like with this beautiful video that uh, uh, Edutopia made about Paul Hamilton. So have a look at this one. I've seen a lot of my kids this year instead of just like 
flooding and getting really upset, they are aware of their emotions. And before lashing out, they will be like, okay, I need to go to the peace corner. Paul Hamilton, we have students who are currently experiencing some serious tragedy in their lives. When they walk through the door, they don't leave everything at the door. They bring it with them. So we're trying to build the capacity for them to be able to know what to do when they're frustrated or when they're angry. So we're using peace corners. There is a peace corner in every classroom. That is a place that a student can go if they need a break, if they just need a time out, they're having a hard time. There's going to be some comfy pillows or bean bags. There'll be some fidgets, different things to help de-escalate that student. If I get, like, really frustrated and feel like I'm going to yell, like, or get, like, mad at somebody, I go to the peace corner and just calm down. We set a five-minute timer so they know that they have five minutes to kind of, like, cool down. If it's really bad and they need some extra time, I said they can flip it again and, you know, take their time. My teacher has this sheet that you fill out. It tells you how you feel, what choice you made, and what should you do to make it better next time. And there's also going to be some sports that talk about breathing or counting or different things the student can do to de-escalate in the moment. And at the end of that time, it's time to reintegrate with the rest of the students. Every kid uses it. So it's not a place of stigma. It's a place that we allow students to utilize the strategies that we're teaching them. We've seen a huge shift in just behavior. There's not as many outbursts. There's not as many arguments because they've realized their emotions, they're understanding them, and they're able to make that decision to sit down at the peace corner. So when we think about peace corners, um, of course the execution of that is gonna be unique and look different in many, many classrooms. The structure's the same, like you just thought. Oops, sorry, the video continued playing. Let me change that volume. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but this strategy is equally relevant for older kids too at middle school, high school level. In fact, Glencliff High School is implemented. Well, you'll see a testimonial from them later. But some of the middle schools and high schools, uh, they differentiated it for older kids. So maybe they don't want, uh, you know, a, a space like this where they would go to a separate space that might feel stigmatizing. Although I have to say, if it looks like that one on the left, a lot of high school students very much, they, they might want like a couch, right? Not the cutesy peace corner uh, elementary looking strategy. But sometimes it might be a check-in, check-out system where uh, they can check out the regulation or fidget tools at the beginning of class, use them in their seats as needed, and then check them uh, back in at the end of class. So um, the execution of this strategy is totally, you know, individualized for that teacher's classroom, that teacher's style, the student's needs and developmental level. So it's such a fun strategy. Now I'm gonna move into our third major goal, uh, which, or depending how they were counted on the slide. Um, but our third goal or priority is implementation of handle with care at the district wide level. So again, remembering we've got about 169 schools. So the magnitude of implementing this system is huge. So handle with care, we partnered directly with the Metro Nashville Police Department. I have to give a shout out to Captain Michelle Richter, um, uh, who, who I partner with on this and, and her team, um, Amy Dunning and Captain Richter actually found Handle with Care early, in the early years and they brought this to me and I said, oh yeah, we're doing this. On the MMPS end, it took us a while to get approvals and it, it took me a while to, to get permission to implement it to help people understand that there wasn't anything legally, you know, risky about this and um, so, we took it on and we partner beautifully. Um, that's been such a great collaboration as well. Just, um, you know, promoting harmony in between the police department and the school district. So essentially what this system is, is a, it's a notification system by design. So basically on a daily basis, the police department sends me uh, just the demographic information. So just the student name, demographic, 
school name of any school age child in Davidson County who is a witness to or a victim of some sort of incident in the community that resulted in a police department in the last 24 hours. So any day it can range from I might have six names on that list, I might have 36 or 46. Um, it just depends on the day. Uh, so then in turn, my team uh, and I provide that daily notification to the corresponding school principal, council worker, social worker, and if they have a communities and schools or community achieves liaison in that building, that person as well. And it's simply a notification, but it's a narrative that says, hey, this kid in your building witnessed a potentially tra traumatizing event, and we're hoping that you'll handle them with care. We know that safe, stable, nurturing relationships and envir environments and promoting resilience are the things that kids all, all need. And then here are a list of real practical strategies that you might choose to implement with your student uh, based on their individual needs. And those things range from, you know, therapeutic, you know, uh, talk or observing how they're doing in the classroom or check-ins or extra time breaks, regulation tools, the whole nine yards, all the way on up to a collaborative referral if they need more intensive trauma-specific interventions, you know, from a mental health provider or a social worker or a behavior specialist or behavior analyst. Um, so it, it basically enhances access to school-based support to meet their needs. So just some numbers um, to give you uh, an understanding of the magnitude of this. So the first year, I think we just implemented it in the spring of that. No, that can't be right. Uh, must have been most of the year. So 2017, 18, we had 2,534 handle with care notifications. Last year, it was 2,841. This school year to date, as of uh, yesterday, um, there were more than 1,440. So we have a lot of kids who are experiencing a lot of uh, difficult things. Um, so one testimonial I want to share around Handle with Care, um, Dr. Jill Pittman, uh, of Over the executive principal of Overton High School said, I just wanted to say thank you for having your team send us the Handle with Care notices. It has been surprising how many times we've been able to help a student or a family as a result of our gentle follow-up after getting the email. Last week, a student from a country of origin let us know about tension in the home that led to a domestic dispute. This is over his father sending most of his earnings back to their country of origin to care for those left behind, leaving the family here often without enough food or resources. Our Overton social worker was able to respond right away. We would never have known about this if it weren't for the notice, so please keep up the good work. Um, so. This really is enhancing access to very needed supports for, for countless kids. Um, I do want to say that we do not communicate any um, information about the nature of the incident whatsoever. We don't even get that from police, nor do we want to know it. Um, we just say, hey, this kid witnessed something potentially traumatic. Now, if a school feels the kid would really benefit from going through, you know, the details of the incident or a trauma narrative or those kind of things, we say very clearly that is not something that should happen in the classroom. In fact, our notification says, you know, you, we wouldn't even recommend talking to the kid directly about the incident. Please just know that this kid may need support right now um, and therapeutic check-ins. Yes, the teachers can be relationship coaches and social emotional health support, um, but it's not their role to do counseling or uh, talk about the event or ask about the event, event directly. But we say very clearly, if you feel your student would benefit from that, please make a referral for, uh, you know, a licensed professional like a mental health or a social worker that, that is equipped to do that and can provide the support for, for your student. Um, and we also emphasize, we don't know what happened. We don't have details about the event. Please take great care not to use this information to stigmatize students or their families. Our, we operate on assumptions that, um, that uh, the student and or the family were witnesses, not instigators of the event. So um, Handle with Care has been extremely impactful and we haven't had any you know, fires to put out or anything like that around it. It's done in a really sensitive way and been really successful. We've gotten a couple awards for it. Um, last year, uh, we got 
uh, an award from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, you know, issued to the Metro Nashville Police Department and Metro Nashville Public Schools for the best intervention for preventing domestic violence. And then the picture on the bottom right, you see Captain Richter out of uniform, which is incredible. I've never seen her out of uniform. And I told her, man, I should have gone to West Virginia to the Handle with Care Conference with you because that was my one and only chance to see you not wearing a uniform. But anyways, um, the Handle with Care themselves at their conference uh, awarded the Extra Mile Award to Nashville. So essentially MNPD and MNPS um, for uh, excellent implementation of Handle with Care. So it's been such a rich partnership. Um, so some successes, I think that I've shared, I think the implementation of things that help kids and help teachers is, is our greatest success. Um, but I will share a success around student discipline. Um, we have demonstrated reductions in office discipline referrals and out of school suspensions across many of our trauma-informed pilot and focus schools. So in year one, Fall Hamilton significantly reduced both office discipline referrals and out of school suspensions. Um, year two, once we had focused schools come on board in that year, it was 10. Um, seven of those 10 reduced uh, discipline referrals, six reduced office, or, I'm sorry, out of school suspension. And then year three, which was last year, I haven't uh, compiled the numbers yet, yet this year to date, but last year, um, 10 reduced, uh, office discipline referrals and eight reduced out of school suspension. So we're really seeing that the needle is moving, shifting discipline practices, as well as the harder to measure things in so many of these schools. Of course, this work's not easy. There are challenges. Um, I'm gonna touch on them quickly, really quickly, because I wanna share some testimonials before our time's up uh, together. But um, I think just the sheer magnitude of the need with the amount of staff we have is probably our, our greatest challenge. When we realize how important relationship is for kids, we, we, we would benefit from more adults to make sure that kids get their social emotional health needs met. So, but also the need of our staff, right? So, um, Sometimes there's deeply ingrained adult mindsets that are more traditional educational practices or more punitive mindsets, traditional discipline approaches or the other, or kind of brushing stuff under the rug and not having the hard conversations um, that, that kids need to have. Uh, we, we are in an occupation where there's a high, high level of stress and burnout. Um, so self-care and collective care can be difficult within a culture that rewards burnout. Um, sorry, I see a typo on my slide that I made at the last minute, but uh, uh, we have a lot of adults in our workforce who have their own resolve, unresolved trauma and toxic stress. And then we have a huge amount of teacher turnover in our district. So every year in some schools, it feels like we're training a whole new faculty. So when we've got a, a you know, a lot of teachers that are moving, are implementing practices have this awareness and understanding. Um, then our workforce changes the next year. And then finally, I think um, a challenge has been prioritization of real resources for this work. So right now, my biggest concern is sustainability of this work and just making sure that social and emotional health um, all the work that happens in student support services, the department I live in, and most certainly the trauma-informed schools work, that funding continues. And I think the awareness and the groundwork that we're laying with the understanding of why this work is so important, um, both just like based on our humanity, but also based on the very clear neurobiological storyline, because of that understanding and awareness, at the top, which we're still working on, um, but we're, we're moving the needle, that's wh when the allocation of resources will happen. So we're, we're walking the path where our trajectory is upward, but certainly this work is not without challenges. Um, so I wanna try to capture the power of collective impact by sharing some testimonials, testimonials with you all. So I'm gonna bring in some other voices, even though Unfortunately, it's going to sound just like my voice. <laughs> I wish I had um, recordings of each of these 
individuals reading their own testimonial, better yet video, but I, I couldn't do that with technology um, in preparation of, of the presentation. So I'm going to try to read them. But the first is from, and I, I hope this, this comes across well, reading these quotes off the slide. So I'm going to do my best, and I hope this is easy to um, digest and take in. So Principal Ted Hed Chad Hedgepath, I've worked with him now at his second school. He did amazing work leading Thomas Edison uh, with Dr. Kesha Walrand uh, the last couple of years, and now he's moved to be the principal of Cole Elementary this year. So he has continued this work with, like, you know, big intensity, big passion this year. So he says, learning about trauma-informed practices has changed the direction of two schools I've served. We've religiously implemented Peace Corners and seen the effectiveness instantly. Students are more aware of their feelings and able to identify when they're about to flip their lid. They're able to use the Peace Corner in each room to identify their feelings and self-regulate with strategy options that are most effective for them. Our teachers have become more aware of how their trauma affects their, their leading students and how self-care is so important in one of the most challenging occupations. So the next school, oh my gosh, so proud of them too, uh, Carter Lawrence Elementary, Dr. Sherlita Sanders, the principal, is doing incredible things, um, in, including a care center, which she probably says in here. So she says, like many of the students in MMPS, the majority of students who attend Carter Lawrence have been impacted by one or more traumatic experiences. Fortunately, MMPS has placed uh, student social emotional health at the forefront of its priorities. As a result, teachers at Carter Lawrence have been able to take part in free trainings to learn more about trauma and how it affects students' brain development and trauma-informed and SEL practices. We consider student social emotional health the foundation of learning. In order to build a solid foundation, we've implemented a variety of trauma-informed and SEL practices, including cozy corners in every classroom, fidget tools, move this world, a mentoring system, a care center staffed by a care specialist, restorative circles, and SEL groups. These trauma-informed strategies enable us to be more proactive than reactive when helping our students become their best selves. The next one is Glencliff High School, which I mentioned earlier. So Laura Fitz, who's a teacher and the restorative practices coordinator, um, with her principal approving the statement, said, um, understanding ACEs and trauma-informed practices has fundamentally transformed the way a majority of our teachers view challenging behavior. Now I hear teachers and administrators talking about how a student is escalated rather than misbehaving or even bad. I often hear teachers talk about how a student's trauma might be imp impacting their academic or behavioral performance. I think we have a long way to go, however, with teachers having a complex understanding of brain development and rather than blaming trauma, seeing resilience as a lever for future success. Um, Waverly Bel Belmont Elementary, also strong, strong work. Um, I'm not, I just saw her yesterday. I don't think she says it in here, but she, she said to me yesterday, she was like, you know how many office discipline referrals we have, Mary? Almost none. We have like maybe 10 for the whole school year to date. So she's really excited. Um, so Susan Blankenship, the principal, says, at Waverly Belmont, social emotional learning is just as important as our academic programs. ACEs and trauma-informed schools training created an awareness with our teachers that opened the door to a change in how we approach challenging behaviors. Our teachers now feel more equipped to handle behavior problems in the classroom give students second chances and allow time for students to take breaks, calm down and reflect. We've seen a significant decrease in those office referrals and suspensions. Merle School, also doing extraordinary work. Their population, pretty much 100% of kids, probably have many, many ACEs. Um, uh, Principal Susan Siegel said that understanding the impact of adverse childhood experiences on our students' neurological development has been particularly helpful here at Merle. Every day we see how the effects of how trauma can make it difficult for our students to manage their behavior. The implementation of peace corners, a sensory path, and morning meetings has provided a safe, caring environment for students to heal and grow. Uh, by the way, at Merle, in every single classroom, they have a teacher, a paraprofessional, and a therapist in every single classroom. So they're really meeting mental health, you know, working hard to meet the mental health needs of their kids as well. 
<laughs> Goodlitzville Elementary. Man, that'd be a good one to visit if you can ever visit the school. They, uh, you should see their climate over there. It is a happy, wonderful place to be. Principal Tracy Gibson is doing incredible work and has just transformed that building. <clears throat> My specialist spent a lot of time there, and the work they're doing on the ground is so impressive. So Goodlitzville Elementary is at the start of our second year being a trauma-informed school. It's amazing to me as the principal what a transformation has taken place in our building, a paradigm shift, I must say. I've noticed several teachers change their entire perspective on why we do what we do when dealing with behaviorally challenging students. We've moved from the days of punitive reactions to a more responsive, collaborative, and proactive approach to building relationships that improves teacher performance and student outcomes. Our trauma-informed team has provided professional development and support to both apprentice and professional teachers alike, giving them both de-escalation skills and background knowledge on the trauma faced by many of our young students. We hope to move to a more inclusive environment, providing the same support to parents and the community as a whole. As a school, trauma-informed practices have changed the entire dynamics for both teachers and students at Goodlitzville Elementary. Um, but She's honing in on trauma-informed practices, the kind of thing she's doing with um, Leader in Me, houses, fostering belongingness and community, and the other social-emotional learning work they're doing is just extraordinary. So Hermitage Elementary, Dr. Matt Owensby, who I've worked with for a few years as well, he's been a focus school for uh, two or three years, he says, one of the most impactful shifts of our trauma-informed training and practices has been that adults take time to consider what other things may be impacting a student before responding. That has had a huge impact on the way we support students in the moment of crisis. At Norman Binkley, the school counselor um, hones in on some of the practices, and she says, at Norman Binkley, the journey of having a trauma-informed school is ongoing, organic, and a breath of fresh air into our school. It is a mindset and a greater knowledge of the brain development of our students and how the serve and return of positive interactions is key. Faculty and staff members have a greater understanding of the toxic stress that students and families have faced. Our administrators have changed the way they handle discipline referrals and plan universal behavior supports for our students. It's not surprising to see them continually encouraging students one-on-one -on -one because of the lens they see them with. We incorporate positive behavior interventions and supports and weekly classroom counseling lessons school-wide to foster resilience in our students on topics such as empathy, courage, gratitude, active listening, and self-regulation. Social-emotional learning is a high priority, and classes begin the day with morning meeting, and SEL is integrated into lessons throughout the day. Peace corners are in every room, and the zones of regulation are also in every room to support students in self-regulation skills or if they need someone to co-regulate with. We have fidget tools across the building and support our teachers' wellness with ongoing self-care practices, such as yoga here at school, a self-care accountability partner, and tap-in, tap-out supports for teachers that need a moment to reset. We're grateful for the trauma-informed approach at our school. Um, Norman Binkley, I think, is one. There's a couple schools in the district, but I think they have school-wide language of flipping the lid like the hand model of the brain. Where, where are you right now? Are you in your upstairs brain or your downstairs brain? And what do you need? And how can I help you get, get your needs met? So when I say school language, I mean that's like daily check-in for all students and teachers throughout the building. So that's really exciting work uh, that, that they should be really proud of. Um, another one that would be totally worth a visit if you ever had the chance is H.G. Hill. Extraordinary work. Um, and I, uh, I researched them a little bit with Move This World. Oh, yeah, Peace Corner Materials, too. But, but real, they have just rock and rolled this on their own. Um, Dr. Carrie Jones hosted me for a visit, just me for invited me to come over and see what she's done. I hadn't even been out to her building for a, a good year. And she was like, Mary, you have to come see. And it just blew my socks off, her whole culture and climate. The one picture on the slide does not capture the amazing things happening in that building. But she said, H.G. Hill Middle has made tremendous strides since being uh, trained in trauma-informed and ACEs. I could speak about quantitative data because we measure in education. Uh, she said, since, uh, since being trained, chronic absenteeism has been reduced. Our academic scores have uh, been high for these two years. Restorative conferences have increased, which decreases our rates of in-school and out-of-school suspensions. But the qualitative data needs to be noted as well. 
the culture and climate at Hale is positive and safe with a foundation of strong relationships. Adults and students have learned to focus on self-care and regulation. Students utilize school-wide peace corners and a peace center in the school. The school is also now integrating social emotional learning standards within classes and academics are being taught in correlation with SEL. We could give many specific examples of students where they acted out, but the core of the action was because they were dealing with trauma. So guiding them through was so much more impactful than giving a punitive consequence. Um, <laughs> everyone's like, go oh, if you could visit Megs is just also extraordinary. So I've got two slides on Megs. Um, one of my favorite people, extraordinary human being, Dr. Sam Underwood says, students at Megs are held to high expectations by parents, teachers, and themselves. It's not uncommon for students to experience high levels of stress and oftentimes lack the skills to manage this stress and anxiety. That's one reason why Megs began integrating social emotional learning in fall 2016, which includes trauma-informed practices. Offering a wide variety of professional development opportunities has been instrumental, so ACES training, social emotional learning trainings, uh, as well as available workshops for teachers after school and integrating SEL into weekly grade level team planning. And Dr. Underwood says the work we are doing around SEL is now a non-negotiable. We've embedded SEL practices in all aspects of the work we do with our students and staff. So a few of his uh, staff members, so Susan Purcell Orlick, uh, she's the SEL specialist. She has just taught kids so much about their brain integrates mindfulness-based lessons, uh, supports teachers regularly. She's incredible, and a lot of this work has happened because of her and Dr. Underwood and, and all of the fine staff. But she said, our administrators prioritize both teacher and student well-being. They encourage people to take care of themselves and have built a school community where everyone feels comfortable asking for help, advice, and support. Um, a sixth grade teacher says, I've been amazed how the SEL initiative aimed at helping students identify and manage stress has been a, an important life skill for the adults in our building to embrace as well. Um, that's probably my favorite quote. I shared that quote with all the principals and executive leadership in the district because when we do this stuff, teach, teach and practice these stress reduction skills with kids and regulation skills with kids, adults develop those same skills and adult self-awareness increases and so our capacity to pull them into our calm rather than allow them to pull us into their storm and our capacity to be that highly regulated adult that the dysregulated kids need more than anything else increases so i love that quote um, finally the last teacher quote one thing i'm so impressed by is the student's ability to name the stressors they're feeling that's something that even adults struggle with they're able to identify exactly what's causing them stress and then match it to one of the strategies to help them calm down. It's exciting for me to watch them work through these emotions in productive ways. So I am um, getting close to the end of my time, so I'm not going to go over because I know everyone has a busy schedule, but other features, Ivanetta Davis uh, Early Learning Center, Tulip Grove Elementary, Dan Mills Elementary, and then some district level teams, so the uh, MMPS behavior support team that I previously worked on, um, really integrating this into their work, the social emotional learning team, same uh, English language learners department, uh, Megan Tricka has a video as well that, she, that could be shared. There's a link if you um, uh, could get access to the slide deck, which I'm happy to share. She talks about the students with interrupted formal education program. Uh, my team and I have worked very closely with them for some years now. And she says, uh, so I'll just read a little bit of hers. Staff in the MMPS uh, Student Scythe program have made a major shift in mindset and prioritization of training and resources. Their program services students who are new to the country, new to English, and often refugees or asylees of the U.S. with life experience that re may result in trauma. Not only do we engage in trainings each year, this work has become a pillar of our program. And they've noticed this work greatly impacting their students when they advocate for their own self-regulation with brain breaks, peace corners, fidget tools. They implement yoga, deep breathing, meditation, all kinds of uh, transformation in their classrooms throughout the district. Um, other features are the Exceptional Education Behavior Coaching Team. We work closely with them. 
restorative practices team, um, so many other teams. Uh, I think I mentioned them on an earlier slide, so I, I won't continue on, but, but so much collective impact and really keeping our focus on the fact of, I could even say it like, ACEs can be an asset. If we can pile on the support kids need, the wound is the place where the light enters you. We can use, you know, the, the struggles that we've had to really transform and um, light up that brilliant light inside each of us. So adversity, you know, can beat us down, but if kids have the supports that they need, adversity can be almost alchemically used to deepen our own humanity um, to get us in touch with the most wonderful aspects of ourselves and the strongest aspects of ourselves and, and create more meaningful ways of life and create a better world. So I'll leave you with that. And it's been such a pleasure um, to be able to share our work with you. Thank you so much for jumping on this webinar. And uh, yeah, I want to echo that. And Mary, you're you're a remarkable person. And um, I want to take a moment of per personal privilege just to say that um, you're exactly the kind of um, example of of what we uh, need to do with this science. And it's uh, you know it, what what we've seen ac across the state is that you know as people learn about adverse childhood experiences. Um, when they take that knowledge and apply it to their own deep knowledge and deep um, well of expertise, this is when the magical stuff comes out. So it's like, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, being exposed to the work of adverse childhood experiences, and it was sort of this aha moment, but the aha moment wouldn't have happened if you didn't have all of your years of experience um, and, and understanding. Um, and then you could see how the science could um, help you evolve your own personal work within the school system. The other thing I want to share with our, our participants is just to say, you know, this is the outcome of very difficult and hard work and not easy work. I mean, uh, Mary's my friend and I've been um, had the privilege of of watching her and um, seeing her come up against various barriers um, and the good wins out at the end of the day. And so even if you're looking at starting this work in your own school system or you know, not in a school system, but um, in a various organization or community, you will come up against challenges and barriers and it will feel frustrating and yet what you see is when you persevere you continue to attract the right people you you continue to inspire them um, and and the good really does win out and kids at the end of the day win out because they have better outcomes so Mary thank you um, for advancing not only um, work in your district, but advancing the work in the state and wor advancing work nationally and internationally as people see how powerful this is. There's no real blueprint for this and you're really crafting, um, you know, what this can look like in a, in a school system. So thank you again. Thanks, Jen. I'm humbled by your words and it is an honor and a privilege to, to be able to make a difference. So thank you. Mary, um, will you just let everybody know, because I know that probably some folks have questions and we um, don't have um, time to answer them right now. Um, I have one question from Richard asking if the slides will be available. She's she said that she'll make them available, so I will send them along with the recorded PowerPoint presentation. But Mary, just give us um, your email address. Know that Mary is slammed, so she may not be able to Thing ASAP, but if you have questions, I'm sure she can entertain them. Um, yeah, so she's pulling it up right now. So just um, right here at the beginning uh, of the presentation is her, is her email um, that she's typing in. So, so if you guys. It's not my email. Yeah, I'll type it in. My name is a funky spelling, but it's just mary.cernabori at mmps.org. Okay. So there you go. All right, Mary. And I'm Thank so sorry you that again. we ran out of time for questions, but yes, happy to answer any questions you have. So feel free. Thanks again for your time, Mary, and thanks for what you do. And uh, we'll we'll see you guys at the next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.